Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. We're going to range of far tonight. We're going to start out with Woody Durham, who died recently at the age of 76. And despite his name Durham, he was not a Duke fan, far from it. He was the voice of the North Carolina Tar Heels for 40 years, from 1971 to 2011. Generations of Tar Heel fans in Carolina Blue heard him call basketball and football games from Chapel Hill. They put Woody on the radio. Let's listen to a couple of his calls of North Carolina winning the NCAA basketball tournament. Here's the 1982 tournament where some freshman named Michael Jordan hits a shot in the last couple of seconds and then Georgetown throws the ball away. I remember sitting in a bar on Clark Street watching the game and one of my friends said, hey, this Jordan kid could be pretty good. With 20 seconds left to play, goes back to Michael Jordan, jumper from out on the left, good! 63-62! 13, 12, 11, Georgetown with one timeout. Fred Brown looking. Oh, wait a minute. 35. The Tar Heels are going to win the national championship. Oh, the Bears is intercepted by James Worthy. That was a pretty good team with James Worthy, Michael Jordan, and Sam Perkins that beat Patrick Ewing and Sleepy Floyd. Here they are in 2005, beating my Illini, the Orange and Blue, in the finals. The Illini were overmatched but fought gamely. Got a couple of bad calls and just couldn't hang out at the end. Brown gets it into Williams. Here comes Williams' front court. Williams on the drive. Gets it back out to head. Long outside shot. Short rebound. And big. It's over. Carolina has won the national championship. And here's my favorite, the 1993 championship game. Carolina is up two with 15 seconds to go against Michigan's Fab Five. Chris Weber gets a rebound for the Maize and Blue travels but the officials miss it then he dribbles up court gets trapped in the corner and calls timeout the only problem is michigan was out of timeouts it cost michigan a chance to tie or win the game and to this day chris weber doesn't like to talk about the timeout he didn't have michigan out of timeout and weber front court carolina thought he traveled with it weber front court carolina with foul. he takes a timeout technical they're out foul. of timeout technical foul technical foul on michigan they're out of timeouts Rose for three. No good. Front of the rim. Lynch with a rebound. Alvin to Phelps. It's over. Carolina. The Tar Heels have won the national championship. That was the legendary Woody Durham at the mic for North Carolina. We're going to move on now to our feature, Hubert de Givenchy, who died recently at the age of 91. He was the famous French dress designer who is best known for dressing Audrey Hepburn in most of her movies. She was his muse, which is ironic because the first time he had a meeting with her, he was under the assumption he was meeting with Catherine Hepburn, not Audrey Hepburn. But the two hit it off immediately. He dressed her in the movie Sabrina. His style for her were basic black dresses, and in fact the movie won the Academy Award for Best Costume Design. But he was not only uncredited in the movie, but the Academy Award was given to Edith Head, the studio costume designer. Nevertheless, from that point on, Audrey Hepburn was firmly in his camp, and he designed for her one of the most famous dresses in all of movies, her little black dress that she wore in Breakfast at Tiffany's. It was a look that women have been copying ever since. He also became the dress designer for Jackie Kennedy. She wore one of his dresses to her state visit to the Palace at Versailles. She couldn't wear too many of his dresses because it looked like she'd be supporting foreign dress designers, but she did wear one of his dresses to JFK's funeral. More about that in a little while. And Givenchy was also dress designer for, among others, Elizabeth Taylor and Lauren McCall, both of whose podcasts we've done, The Duchess of Windsor and Princess Grace. Here's Matthew Bannister from the BBC4 Last Word on Hubert de Givenchy. Hubert de Givenchy was the French fashion designer best known for dressing the film star Audrey Hepburn. He opened his first Paris shop at the age of 24 and went on to become one of the most influential designers of his generation. Hubert came from an aristocratic family, as the fashion writer Veronica Horwell explains. The really, really important person was his maternal grandmother, who was the widow of a major supervisor of the Beauvais tapestry factories. Alors je demandais à ma grand-mère, voilà, est-ce que j'ai le droit, vu mes notes? She opened the doors and the drawers, and inside them were two centuries of French textiles. It must have been like having your own private museum. Et c'est là où j'ai, si vous voulez, découvert mon intérêt. 
It turned him on, there is no other word for it, to textiles for life. How did his career begin? His mother said, you can become a designer if that's what you want, but you've got to go to proper art school. And indeed, he went to college in Paris. He came out of that just post-war, and he was a charmer. Lanky, elegant, interesting. So the couturier, Schiaparelli, coming back to Paris after the end of the war, found that she still had a warehouse of unused 1930s printed silks with designs that were surrealist and wildly out of date. But she said, if you can sell them, you go ahead and design something. He made separates out of them. They sold. Suddenly, he had a slight reputation. And were separates his invention? Were they the things that he was known for? No. But in 1947, with a Europe-wide dearth of wearable clothing, they were an awfully brilliant thing to be in charge of. How did he come into contact with Audrey Hepburn? In 1953, Audrey Hepburn had just made Roman Holiday in which she'd established herself as a great romantic comedy lead, a kind of democratic princess. But on the back of that, she was set to make another movie, Billy Wilder's Sabrina, which came out in 1954, and decided that she wanted the studio to provide her with her own clothes, and that Jean, she was precisely this young, fresh persona that she wanted to project. Sadly, the dresses for Sabrina won an Oscar. He didn't get it, because Edith Head, the studio designer, took the credit. He must have been very upset, but... Audrey Hepburn was obviously very grateful to him because she went on to form this long-term relationship, including, of course, the clothes for breakfast at Tiffany's. Oh, river, wider than a mile. That little black dress, which isn't at all little, it's a careful presentation of a certain kind of youthfulness in conjunction with a huge projection of, I would say, specifically Parisian sophistication. Wherever you're going, I'm going your way. How would you describe a classic Hubert de Givenchy dress? Young, fresh, in the service of the woman who wears it, whether she's a movie star or just a... Well, a fairly wealthy, ordinary woman. How would you position Givenchy in the pantheon of, of French design? As the great transition between the period of maximum grandeur with Dior's new look and the newer fellas who come in at the end of the 1950s, the beginning of the 1960s, who are all about the youth. Oh. River and Veronica Holwell on Hubert de Givenchy. Regarding the suit that Jackie Kennedy wore to JFK's funeral, which I mentioned before, one of the mysteries is no one knows where it is today. It was a black Givenchy suit that was made up of a jacket and a skirt, and for the funeral she had a custom-made veil. She said she wanted the veil that could cover her face but not hide her completely. She wore the suit before the funeral, at least the jacket, to JFK Jr.'s christening, the funeral of the ambassador to Spain, and Eleanor Roosevelt's funeral as well. After JFK's funeral, Jackie wore the suit a final two times, one on December 3, 1963, for an award presentation to honor the bravery of Clint Hill, the Secret Service agent who jumped onto the presidential limousine after JFK was shot, and then the final time on December 5th to leave the White House. The JFK Library doesn't have it in their possession, and they also don't have the coats worn by Carolyn and John John at the funeral. A lot of people assume that the Kennedys still own all three costumes. Well, we're going to close tonight with John Cassiopo, who died recently at the age of 66. He was a professor of psychology at the University of Chicago, and he co-founded, along with Gary Bernstein of Ohio State, the field of social neuroscience. He was probably the world's expert in social isolation and loneliness, and he did a lot of work with his wife, Stephanie, who was also an assistant professor at the University of Chicago. They shared an office, a desk, and maintained a partnership in life and in research. Here's Professor Cassiopo talking about loneliness. In the United States, we think about 
loneliness in a, a fashion where it's a weakness. It's uh, a disease. That is, it's the same thing as depression, or it's a, a personality disorder, perhaps an extraordinary introvert, so much so that they are shy and unable to work or, or relate to others. And our research simply shows that is an error. Uh, at a broader societal level, I think the last half of the 20th century, we've seen this move toward individualism, really uh, idealizing the mythic rugged individualist. One of our cherished cultural statements is united we stand, divided we fall. I mean, we, as a society, understand the importance of working together and being a team. Some of our cherished stars in athletics have enormous team efforts behind them. We tend to only talk about the leader of that team, but without the team itself behind them, they wouldn't be the stars or have made the physical achievements that they had made. It's interesting. I see our cultural is somewhat ambivalent about it, but I think there has been this move to celebrate a rugged, mythic individualist and to not recognize the importance of the underlying collective and its, its work. I also see that changing. Both uh, Obama and McCain in this election campaign are arguing for the importance of community efforts, uh, the importance of rising above self-interest. In science 50 years ago, the most impactful work in many fields was being done by the solitary genius. That is no longer the case. The research clearly shows that science is now a team activity, and the most influential work in the natural sciences, in the social sciences, in patents, and even in the humanities are coming from team efforts, not from individual efforts. And that's because the questions are so complicated requires so many different expertise to being brought to bear at one time, no single individual has all the necessary expertise. So in many ways, I see culturally uh, a pendulum perhaps starting to swing back in the other direction. I think it's, again, we've always realized that united we stand, and we've always realized that there's these teams beneath these celebrated individuals, but I think we're, we're starting to recognize the importance of that underlying team. And so I'm hopeful that we will start to celebrate not only the individual achievement, but also the collective, because I think that's actually more consistent with what human nature is fundamentally and what makes us happy in the long term. People who live only self-interested lives end up at the end of their life, perhaps with money to give away, but how much money do you really want to give away at the end of your life? I mean, Ebenezer Scrooge is a story all about such individuals. Uh, and I think we're starting to realize that life lived well means a life lived with others. The research to date still raises causes for concern. In 1984, there was a national survey done uh, in which people were asked, how many confidants did you have? The most frequent answer was three. That survey question was repeated in the early part of this decade, and the most frequent answer was zero. That is a dramatic change. If you look at the number of individuals living alone in the houses, it's increased by 30% in the last 30 years. Now, partly this is because people are getting older and they're losing their spouse through death, and they're losing children through going off to college or to jobs, but it's not exclusively. Even when you look at the demography at an age, you see an increase in the number of individuals living alone and putting off having children, divorce rates being high, single parent households have increased. All of those are contributing to more isolated living. So there are reasons for concern. I think as we understand human nature better, uh, there will be a reason, a little more impetus for that pendulum to start to swing back in the other direction. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps, as a final tribute to Professor Cassiopo. I'm going to play what I think is the best song ever about loneliness. Done in 1965 by the country music group, the Statler Brothers. Quentin Tarantino borrowed it for Pulp Fiction. Here is Flowers on the Wall. It's a great song. Count flowers on the wall. That don't bother me at all. Playing solitaire till dawn. With the deck of 51. Smoking cigarettes and watching Captain Kangaroo. Now don't tell me. I've nothing to do, but don't tell me I've nothing to do.